Ah, no problem. Um, good afternoon. Uh, so, the, um, I'll talk, talk about the film that we're going to see um, in the context of a concept that, um, well, I, I'm working on, on it, but it's also quite emergent in Philippine cinema. So, the area uh, is Philippine cinema and a quite emergent concept called regional cinema, which um, I'll try to problematize. So, uh, so I, I'll do a little bit of history and a little bit and um, uh, the context of the political economy of regional cinema uh, as a way to um, talk about the significance of the film Tupog Imatui. So in this paper, I focus on Tupog Imatui or The Right to Kill, a little film from Mindanao, in order to chart the contemporary landscape of Philippine cinema and comment particularly on the challenges and opportunities a filmmaker beyond the mainstream faces in seeking to contribute to the political cinema of our troubled times. Tupog Imatui, literally to kill, has inspired reviews analyzing Arnel Mardocchio's screenplay, uh, which is informed by the indigenous people's historical and ongoing struggle against encroachers, and commending R.B. Barbarona's feat of sh shooting in a rugged terrain, working with non-professionals, and handling all the technical aspects of the creative process. So he shot, he edited, he, he scored, he did everything. So the film focuses on the travails of the Lumad, or, so you know, the Lumad, caught in the crossfire between the state military and the rebel forces. Particularly, the film follows the experiences of a Manobo family whose peaceful lives are disrupted when soldiers abduct, abuse, and humiliate the parents, Dawin and Obunai, and use them as guides through the forest while their children, Langit and Ilian, are left to fend for themselves. In what follows, I want to contextualize the film's significance in the shifting patterns of national, regional, local, and global formations, film formations. I want to reflect on how the itinerary of a small film can outline the contours of Philippine cinema today and highlight how even a marginal film is networked globally. Um, Tupogi Matui, while it portrays the centuries-old way of life of an indigenous community, is undoubtedly a 21st century film, animated by global forces as much as it contributes to regional art production. In both contexts, the film occupies a marginal space, but the significance of these distinct marginalities is not the same. As a local film in a global context, the time for such a film has inevitably come, but as a regional film in the national context, its arrival has actually come quite late. Mardocchio's and Barbarona's previous films, as well as other films beyond Manila, have been spotlighted in Cinema Region, the flagship project of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Since its arrival in 2008, Cinema Region has grown significantly from programming only a handful of films in its first year to showing now over 100 films in its 11th year. So ganun yung growth niya sa 11 years. Uh, NCCA, through its efforts to develop homegrown talent, has helped put the notion of regional, quote-unquote, filmmaking in public notice by financially supporting the founding or mounting of smaller festivals in the regions throughout the archipelago. Um, so uh, these festivals include, from Mindanao, Festival de Cine Paz in Sambuanga City, Cine Animo in Ozamis, Cine Magis Northern Mindanao Film Festival in CDO, Sala Mindanao Film Fest in General Santo City, Lantawan Sox Sargent Film Fest, um, Nabi Filmex in Nabunturan, Compostela Valley, Cine Bugsay in Caraga, Ngil Ngig and Mindanao Film Fest in Davao City. From Visaya, Cine Negrense Negros Island Film Festival in Bacolod, Lutas Negros Oriental Film Festival in Dumaguete, Sinulog Short Film Festival and Binisaya in Cebu City and uh, the traveling Cine Casimanua Western Visayas Film Fest that goes around the Panay Islands. From Luzon, the North Luzon Film Festival, first held in Tugigaraw City, Pasale in Naga, Pelicultura Calabarzon Film Fest in Los Baños, and Cine Cabalen Kapampangan Film Fest. So these are the festivals that uh, NCCA supports. In fact, however, filmmaking outside the NCR began earlier than 2008 and it did not result from the Protean period in Manila in the 2000s when the meaning of indie was being contested and defined against an ailing mainstream cinema. Siguro, I'll say a little bit of background. So in the early 2000s, uh, in the late 90s, Philippine cinema was pronounced as dead. 
Uh, there was a very uh, steep decline in movie go movie going. Uh, productions were really bad. And in the 2000s, digital technology was introduced. And in Manila, the, the debate was, should we go mainstream or should we go indie? That was what was happening in Manila. And it, cul it culminates uh, with the coming of this festival called Cinema Lion Independent Film Festival in 2005. So what I'm trying to say here is that actually, while that was happening in Manila, something else was happening uh, in the region. So, um, we can backtrack to the 1990s. In Negros, short films were being made out of the Negros Summer Workshop established as early as 1991 by Pekka Galiaga. I'm not mentioning anymore the industries in the 60s and 70s in Cebu. Um, so I'm speaking of the uh, more recent uh, history. So it was established by Pekka Galiaga and they made several shorts. In 1993, Elbert Banyares from Iloilo made Banal he, when he was 16 years old, an experimental film that won the first uh, best regional entry at the Gawad CCP. Soon after the digital features, so the first features in digital were Still Lives by John Red, Camias Overground by Candela Cruz, which is a, uh, like an anthology, and uh, Motel, uh, Triptych, and they were made in 99 and 2000. But actually, soon after that, Teng Manganzakan was already making his documentary, uh, which was released in 2001 called House Under the Crescent Moon. Uh, which deals with the government's all-out war in Mindanao. J.P. Carpio from, uh, from Bacolod made Balay Dahu, a feature film in 2002. In 2003, a group in Davao City led by Dax Canedo held the guerrilla filmmaking workshop uh, that produced short films and documentaries. It, it later would become the Mani Mindanao Film Festival. They renamed it because guerrilla <laughs> apparently attracted the wrong people. Um, <laughs> So the following year, Ray Gibraltar from Iloilo put up the Bantayan Film Fest. So this was 2004, very early, with the help of Galiaga and uh, cinematographer Ogi Sugatan that featured short works by teachers. Ang gumagawa, no? So between 2004 and 2006, a group of friends started exploring film in Cebu and gave birth to Binisaya, a movement led by Keith Deliguero and some other filmmakers, before it became a film festival. When Cinemalaya held its first edition in 2005, therefore, there had been already a lot of production of so-called regional films uh, beyond Manila. And in the first year of Cinemalaya, Lawrence Farad's film from Bacolod, Cultado, received the jury prize. And when Cinema One held its second edition, Sherad Anthony Sanchez's film, Huling Balya ng Buhi, received the Best Picture Award. So around this time, Mes de Guzman was making a film in Benguet, Brillante Mendoza in Pampanga, uh, Alvin Yapan in Bicol, and uh, Sharon Dayok in Basilan, among others. And they were released around the same time, five, 2005 to 2007. At that point onward, Manila-based festivals will fund and screen films beyond NCR. Um, so the enabling factors of digital technology in the virtual networks of cinephilia were not imported from Manila to the provinces, the usual root of film culture in the celluloid century, the 20th century, but rather from the global elsewhere to urban, suburban, even peri-urban formations in the islands. In other words, we were, we were all watching pirated movies all at the same time from elsewhere, not from Manila. So the usual celluloid uh, exportation, no? yung Manila to the provinces, yung mga scratched films, hindi yun yung ruta. No? Uh, the digital film cultures in Bacolo, Iloilo, Cebu, Davao, and their outskirts developed alongside the one in Manila in synchronicity with the development of marginal cinemas, not just in the Philippines, but actually around the world. So this is quite, uh, uh, this is well documented. In this slide, quote-unquote, regional filmmaking could refer just as well to how secondary cities in the Philippines had parallel experiences with independent cinemas across, across Southeast Asia, ranging from the coming of so-called new waves in Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, Saigon, and Bangkok, to the steady growth of alternative cinemas in Jogja, Makassar, Purbalinga, Sabah, to name a few. Um, in short, what galvanized filmmaking in Philippine regions in the digital period are the same global impulses that energize the indie scene in the larger Southeast Asian region. Thus, momentous, the momentous establishment of Cinema Region and the growing consciousness on regional filmmaking in recent years in the Philippines actually indicate a lag in the recognition of films beyond Manila as part of national cinema, of the long and ongoing struggle for local stories and issues to take their rightful place in the mainstream of the national imaginary. It is remarkable then that Tupog Imatui, which, with its urgent call about the besetting national problem, was only made in 2017 and earned, earned acclaim in 2018, 
eventually winning major prizes from national award-giving bodies like FAMAS and Gawad Urian. Um, so, global cinema's discursive, cultural, and economic openness to quote-unquote other cinemas has encouraged the productivity of marginal films vying for a space in the center or creating niches in the peripheries. The advent of Cinema Line 2005 and the subsequent proliferation of film festivals in the Philippines. So, siguro kakaiba, eh, siguro, the, what's interesting about the Philippine cinema today is that it has this Philippine uh, film festival model that you find nowhere else in the world where we have like uh, more than 10 film festivals, major festivals that produces about, you know, times 10 of these films and then regional festivals that produce uh, X number of films. And this is the main distribution network. So we don't really get to see these films beyond the festivals. It's usually in a festival scenario. So it does encourage productivity, but at the same time, we hardly ever see the films beyond the festival. So uh, these festivals have been more welcoming of inventive works that would otherwise not be produced by mainstream studios, but at the same time, they compete in the market against each other by the sheer number of their outputs and more explicitly against Hollywood, of course, and commercial films in the local city centers, against which their films always appear comparatively small. So usually, mukhang low budget, right? They really look like cheaply made films. On the other hand, these festivals serve as sources for global, global films that have figured well in the network of international film festivals where a different kind of validation is attained for so-called national cinema. So hindi naman natin siya, we're not really watching them in the Philippines, right? They're being, be, being viewed elsewhere. This double-coded aspiration is typified by Sinag Maynila Film Festival where Tupog Imatoy first premiered before being screened in Cinema Region in Compostela Valley. So, Nag Maynila muna before Compostela Valley. Si Nag Maynila, literally the race of or from Manila, is funded by Solar Entertainment, which imports and exports commercial content to and from the Philippines. Um, and its films are selected by Cannes Prize winner, and uh, if I may say so, uh, uh, the Riefenstahl of uh, the Philippines, Brillante Mendoza. <laughs> Unlike other festivals, Sinag Maynila does not produce films, but rather scouts for homegrown stories that are potential content for wider distribution in the Philippines and in the markets abroad. The festival, whose identity is anchored on the image of Manila as the center of filmmaking, is also branded as enabling sining local pang international, so local movies for the international market, which alerts us to the complexity of the contemporary situation where initiatives by the state and private corporations, so Cinema Region and Sinag Maynila, for example, are providing platforms for regional filmmakers. So it's contaminated, in other words. The Tupog Imatuy, a fearlessly political film in a production on a shoestring, is programmed in Sinag Maynila indicates how older paradigms that made clear distinctions between first second and third cinemas have become inoperable. First cinema refers to industrial filmmaking and its ultimate model is Hollywood. So in the Philippines, of course, the biggest cinema is first cinema or industrial filmmaking. And um, solar entertainment is doubtless a conduit and enabler of this system of filmmaking in this century. Uh, following a parallel path, non-conforming filmmakers have throughout history questioned formulaic and profit-oriented industry filmmaking and they have constituted this so-called second cinema. Films of this type are realized by independent artists rather than studio-employed craftspeople. The tradition of second cinema films in the Philippines grew enough to become a series of waves from the 70s to the 2000s. Um, interestingly, Sinag Maynila is part of this cultural and political economy as well because uh, they're uh, driven by festival production that encourages innovation and newness for an expanding market. So, in other words, nandun din sila sa field na yon. No? Third cinema is militant, anti-colonial, and anti-fascist cinema, exemplified by a number of socialist realist films by the likes of Lino Broca, and more pointedly by political collective films during and after the Marcos period. Such films did not aspire or do not aspire to be art, nor do they endeavor to be distributed commercially, but like yung, uh, what Jaja was talking about, Johnny was talking about earlier, these are films that want to speak to a larger public without necessarily being commercialized. Clearly, the desire to shed light on what is obscured in public consciousness and to reach a wide audience is at the heart of the production of Tupug Imatoy. The plot of Tupug Imatoy dramatizes Lumad's experience of dislocation and its imagery, a gesture toward vanishing forest covers, massive mining operations, and the unnatural sight of backhoes parked amidst uh, the green, uh, the forest. 
quite startlingly, the film closes with documentary footage of the real Obunai. So Tupog Imato is based on a real story. Um, speaking of the trauma of fleeing her militarized village in Talaingo, Davao del Norte, and traveling with a thousand others to Davao City as a bakwit or evacuee, only to be kidnapped by soldiers along the way. So this is the real story behind Tupog Imatui. Obunai was kidnapped while they were evacuating from the militarized village to the city. So Arby Barbarona is from Tagum, and that's why, uh, so growing up, he had a lot of, he had Lumad friends, and and uh, doing research on Tupog Imatui, he was immersed in the evacuation centers in Tagum. No? In the older paradigm, second, especially third cinema films were expected to steer clear of the first cinema structures. Any form of quote-unquote compromise was anathema to independence. So this was a debate in the 2000s. But the globalization of marginal films is now well documented and the myriad experiences of filmmakers laboring in the peripheries caution us from making sweeping claims and invite us to consider concrete cases like Tupog Imatoy's case. From being conceived in Davao City, shot on location the border between Davao and Bukidnon, distributed through a Manila company and exhibited in Tokyo, Berlin, Luxor, Jakarta, to moving back to Mindanao, Compostela Valley, and being screened eventually in Davao City again. The itinerary of Tupog Imato is instructive for it reveals the constraints and options that regional filmmakers as ground-level agents must negotiate in order to be visible and yet continue to harbor the potential for political resistance. A Mindanaoan film thus casts in relief the shape of contemporary cinema in a particular way, a small production made out of passion and conviction uh, by mavericks from the region riding the new wave, lending itself as content for Sinag Manila, bending over backward in search for a national audience, and extending its reach to an international audience. It is a truism that mainstreaming the arts from the ethno-linguistic cultures throughout the islands can help create a more complete tapestry of Filipino identity. In this sense, Tupog Imatoy vividly portrays the re what regional films uh, contribute best to Philippine cinema. So moviegoers are shown local culture, essentially. No? Uh, as the film opens, we witness the dynamics of family life. We learn about the Manobos' views on nature and their belief that the spirits of the departed come back to guard their ancient ancestral land. We are given insight on their folklore and how new tales are created by the community as they struggle against trespassers. In this borderland that may seem far away to moviegoers, history may be understood not as a line moving forward but as space layered in time. The aesthetics and creative strategies of Tupog Imato resonate with the project The Fourth Cinema, term proposed by Maori filmmaker Barry Barclay to identify indigenous films produced in settler colonial nations like New Zealand. So the notion of fourth cinema connotes how the previous categories of first, second, and third cinemas have actually functioned as invader cinemas, and how the first peoples of the land have been obscured by the narrative of national orthodoxy and rendered static, vanished, or exotic. Fourth cinema is a distinct mode of filmic production and address, an address that is partial to indigenous expression, dignified representation of place and identity, and political engagement both on screen and off screen. In fact, the term lumad uh, does not refer to a particular group, but to the native of the land. And as such, the idea of fourth cinema is synonymous to lumad cinema. No? And I'm proposing to use that term, at least in this case. The process of fourth cinema capture well the experience uh, so this was uh, Barbie, uh, RB playing um, uh, to the crowd in Tokyo. So the process of fourth cinema capture well, uh, captures well the experience of filming the plight of and working with the Lumad, who have been subjected to oppression by colonizers, settlers, land grabbers in the state. So Barbarona's process of working with the locals to make the film that speaks of natives' tragic experiences instantiates community, collaboration, and reciprocity in the spirit of fourth cinema. So what he did was uh, he, he immersed, he did his research, he, uh, and he also ano, asked the help of the Luma to make the film. So, so parang he and a uh, sound person and then the community. They help each other create the film. Such res resonance highlights peripheral networks, translocal affinities, and international connections beyond adjacent geographical spaces and regions across the globe where dispossessed peoples can forge new solidarities. Tupog Imatui reminds us that the Lumad are the original inhabitants of the land who nevertheless stand to lose the most in the face of a never-ending war waged in the name of development. 
Framed in this way, the political project of art making is seen from a longer historical perspective and the Manobos in this context stand si side by side with different indigenous uh, peoples who are also making the same kinds of films. For example, Ap Apaches in Oklahoma, Yupik Eskimos in Alaska, uh, Martus in Australia, Vedas in Sri Lanka, the Was in Myanmar, and others, so on and so forth. Natives of all of the all of the paradoxical and aggregated future past of the land, the subject of fourth cinema. Regional films enrich Philippine cinemas, yes. Um, but more significantly, some of them, like Tupog Imatui, some of them reactivate the radical potential of the margins that the proliferation of indie films have tamed. So this is, I guess, what we feel now in Manila, that there are so many quote-unquote indie films that there's really, in a way, nothing new. Right? Um, and this was the energy that was important in the early 2000s that is now happening in, the reg in regional cinema. Something new is happening. We're hearing new stories we've never heard before. We're seeing modes of filmmaking we've never seen before. And so they're offering something different. But as, I mean, just to summarize what I've been saying, we cannot watch them without the apparatus of the International Film Festival, the National Film Festival in Manila, and all these things that they must negotiate, right? So the only way we are able to see Tupog Imato is if it is part of Sinag Maynila. No? So, so this is, in a way, the contamination that I've been discussing. Here again, Tupog Imato as a particular case is instructive because it aimed at revealing how global forces have been relentless in their drive to erase societies in the peripheries in collusion with the state. For this reason, the production of such a film from the margins is necessary, meaning a film from there about that place, right? To amend a dominant narrative that sees indigenous peoples merely as enriching Filipino identity and to address a wider public about the actual plight of the Lumad. And I guess this is where the um, Tupogi Matoy is a little different from what Ajani was talking about because it's a feature film, a feature narrative film, whereas most of the films being made about the Lumad are in documentary form. No? Uh, and this is also, I guess, the reason why th the documentary remains a kind of... Um, Margin, another margin, because uh, a feature film will break through in a f film festival like Sinag Maynila. No? That's right. So actually, Arby Barbarona is a documentary filmmaker. So this is a kind of also a, a crossover for Arby. No? Um, so on the level of the national, we have, I'm nearly done. No? So on the level of the national, we have frequently heard about the situation of the Lumad framed in media as a question of political instrumentalization. Tupog Imatoy. So, for example, the fallout is, as Rosa was pointing out to me uh, yesterday, is that after Tupog Imatoy gained acclaim, so he won Best Director in Gawadurian and in um, FAMAS, then the film traveled around, then he was red baited. So, suddenly on Facebook, you have these claims by anonymous uh, people say, be careful of Tupog Imatoy because, you know, so, um, which would not have happened if Tupog Imatoy remained a film in Mindanao. So uh, something is, uh, in a way, it threatened something uh, which received a kind of backlash, which in, in a way is a, is a good thing as far as Tupog Imatoy is concerned. Um, Tupog Imatoy indeed shows the Lumad caught in the middle, their places of ref refuge mil militarized. Um, and uh, no, they're utilized by the government military in their counterinsurgency efforts. But the logic of the appalling threats made recently by the president, who hails from Mindanao no less, of bombing Lumad sp spaces, sabi niya, because they have been politicized and they have taken sides, misses the bottom line. Which for me, at least, is, and for, I guess, indigenous filmmaking anywhere in the world, the bottom line is whose birthright is the land? And why are Lumad places being militarized? Ultimately, this question cannot be addressed without reference to an international situation. The valiant Lumad of the world have for centuries fought and today continue to resist encroachers, be they Kankanais in Benguet, uh, Mayans in Guatemala, etc., which is why the richest natural reserves that transnational businesses are greedy to extract can still be found in indigenous lands. The strategy of progress by dispossession, militarizing indigenous territories so that extractive industries could rapaciously pillage is a global threat which have resulted to environmental degradation, human rights abuses. And Bar Arby was talking to me about this, that when he showed this film to in, in Egypt, for example, and in, in different places, the resonance was not... This is a regional film 
in the Philippines, but rather we have the same situation here, wherever he was presenting the film. Um, uh, so, so, uh, so global threats which have resulted to envir environmental degradation, human rights abuses, such as those that you will see in the film, like displacement, persecution, humiliation, coercion, torture, rape, and extrajudicial killings. In this light, Tupog Imatui, a little film from an outpost of national cinema, is calling the world's powers to account. So, salamat po. So, what happens now? <laughs> Sure. Um, because RV was also in Berlin for the film festival that we organized. And he said, um, so the woman, the main protagonist in the film, she won also awards. And she's a nun, as, as Patrick said, they're all nun actors, I think, except for one. And the woman is a Manopo woman. And it was a very interesting story because he went to the communities and he was actually, he wasn't looking for an actress. And then there was this one woman and he saw her and he was like, are you willing to be the actress for this movie? And she had no training whatsoever. And then she went on to, to, to win awards. And Arby also is a, his stepfather's Manopo. Yeah, that's right. So, so. he's also very much um, uh, embedded into the community. So. So that's why his father, his stepfather is Manobo and he has a best friend na Lumad. And then of course living in Tagum City where the evacuation centers were. So he's re uh, I mean, siguro the, the next step that we it would, would be great to see would be when the Lumad really are making the films. But I mean, as far as we're concerned now, this is the next best thing where RB immerses in the community and makes the film from there. I mean, this is what we see in Tupogimatu. Right? I think Ajani should also be here so they can also address questions. <laughs> uh, so we're colleagues in the same film institute uh, in UP. No? So, yeah, uh, una. Uh, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, it's very difficult to get to, to watch them, even in the Philippines. So like with Tupog Imatoy, I, I ask RB directly. They're usually quite generous, so the, it's a typical way uh, you ask them directly, the, the producer, the director. Although, uh, a, a, a new development is that since many of these filmmakers are always looking for funders elsewhere, of late, they have not been allowed to share their films so freely because, well, the producers have given some money and therefore you have to ask the producers for permission. So this is, again, another sad part of the negotiation. They need the funds to make the films, but at the same time, uh, at what price? So, But in this case, because the, this was funded almost purely by friends, NGOs, Kilab, uh, the network of RB, then we we're able to access it freely. So, yeah. If it's any docu from the Philippines, you can contact docu. <laughs> it's a very small community. And that, that's why I built docu. Yeah.